The ministerial summit of non-aligned movement continues this Tuesday in Serbia. The transfer from Ecuador's biggest private bank, Banco Pichincha, have been blocked for 72 hours due to a cybersecurity incident. The first results of the parliament elections in Iraq were presented by the Electoral Commission of the Arab country. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South. I'm your host, Gladys Quesada, and these are the news. The second day of the non-aligned movement's commemorative summit begins in the Serbian capital, Belgrade. An intense round of bilateral meetings has marked the prelude to this second day between the two de delegations of the attending countries. During the opening session, the different interventions urged to fight together against coercive measures as a mechanism to impose political agendas and to seek international cooperation as the only way towards prosperity. 114 delegations from various countries and 40 ministers of foreign affairs are participating in the summit. The group, which was created at the first conference of the Belgrade summit held on September 1st, 1961, maintains peace, non-interference, cooperation and the certainty that a multipolar world is the way for a better humanity as a cross-cutting interest. The future should be one among equals, where the same rights are valid for all. That was the direction this movement embarked on since the beginning. And it is the ideal one because today we are still fighting. Defending this ideal is not only a matter of individual countries. It is also one of the big steps humanity must take if we want the world to survive. In this context, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres praised the role of the Non-Aligned Movement Summit during critical times of health, economic and environmental crisis and the need to find common ground with the UN agenda for sustainable development. We also continue to draw strength from the voice of the non-allied movement in our pursuit of eliminating nuclear weapons and creating a world that is safer and free of the threat of weapons of mass destruction. In all our challenges, international cooperation and multilateralism are essential. Let's keep working together to translate ideas into transformative policies and concrete action. Action that puts a focus on youth and future generations, strengthens gender equality, ensures equal rights and opportunities, rebuilds trust, and creates more peaceful and just communities. The President of the Republic of Azerbaijan, Ilham Aliyev, defended the dedicated efforts of the movement to preserve global peace and solidarity. Since its establishment in 1961 in Belgrade, the NAM has played an important role in the international arena with its dedicated efforts for the sake of global peace, justice, and solidarity in the world. Being the largest international institution after the UN General Assembly, the NAM is considered a genuine example of multilateralism, with its crossly membership uniting 120 countries from diverse historical, political, and cultural backgrounds. Venezuela's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Felix Plasencia, noted the importance of applying the principles of the United Nations Charter to strengthen multilateralism amid the constant aggressions made by the Western powers. The time has come to double our efforts to defend and make our values stand, to defend the United Nations principles and charter, and the international law, the best shield that we, the countries of the South, have to protect ourselves from the persistent aggressions made by the big powers. We call upon you to join our forces and reaffirm the soundness of this lawful instrument to promote, preserve, and strengthen multilateralism as the most inclusive way to work for all that this charter stands for, troubles of an everyday, more connected world that concern us all. Nicaragua's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Denis Moncada, urged for the elimination of the patents over the anti-COVID-19 vaccines. Unfortunately and unacceptably, anti-COVID-19 vaccine hoarding on behalf of developed nations has resulted in little access to the vaccine for developing countries. It is fair and necessary to provide the technological transparency and the financial resources as well as to eliminate the patents of these antivirals that should be considered a common property of humanity. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of Zimbabwe, Frederick Chava, stressed that although progress has been made, there is work to be done to achieve the movement's goals. We celebrate the successes which we have achieved. We should equally acknowledge the enormity of the work uh, still to be done, including outstanding challenges 
such as the sovereignty and the independence of the peoples of uh, Western Sahara and uh, Palestine, there are also new emerging challenges that we need uh, to confront, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, and the scourge of terrorism and violent extremism. In other news, a 24-hour strike called by the right wing through the cult civic committees failed in seven of the nine Bolivian departments. According to the evaluation of the Ministry of Government, it only had an impact in Santa Cruz and Cochabamba. Sectors of the Bolivian right wing maintained the call for a strike against President Luis Arce. The groups announced they will block 20 road points after the national government order to continue with the investigations in relation to the coup d'etat of November 2019. Spokespersons of political and indigenous groups have denounced that the right wing seeks to undertake new violent actions and are the same extremist groups that staged the coup against former President Evo Morales. The community of El Alto said it will not comply with the protest and they are beginning to unblock the streets. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. The transfers from, from Ecuador's biggest private bank, Banco Pichincha, have been blocked for 72 hours due to a cybersecurity incident. In a communique, the bank's executives explained that they have isolated the rest of the network from the affected systems and that an investigation with cybersecurity experts is underway. Banco Pichincha assures that its network agency is operating and that ATMs are suitable for cash withdrawal and credit or debit card payments. The bank managers also affirm that technological setback does not diminish its functioning of any financial activities. However, the company's website says it's temporarily unavailable. After the meeting between the Mexican and the U.S. delegations, President Joe Biden wrote a letter where he declares his plan to face the causes of the migratory waves spanning from Central America. Mexican Chancellor Marcelo Ebrard read the U.S. president's message. The most successful and sustainable way of discouraging migrants is assessing the fundamental causes of their migration. The lack of economic opportunities, the weak government management, corruption, violence and insecurity. That is why highlighting our commitment with Central America and my administration, I use an all-around approach based on the lessons learned in my years ahead of this task force as was a Vice President of the United States. In the letter read by Chancellor Ebrard, President Biden highlighted the increase of investments in Central America regarding cooperation between the United States and Mexico. I hope to work with you to use our cooperation specifically increasing the investments in Southern Mexico and Northern Central America. I am glad to have our development agencies traveling together to El Salvador to identify new opportunities. I appreciate the financing of your government in Northern Central America and in the youth programs to build a future and offer employment and technical abilities to the new generations, as well as guaranteeing sustainable income to poor families and rural communities known for their high numbers of migrants. The Colombian people condemned the murder of a 12-year-old boy and a 18-year-old young man in Tibu, north of Santander, after a robbery. Witnesses stated that the victims were tied up to be handed over to the authorities, but armed men took them to a rural area of the municipality and killed them. The local inhabitants condemned the minor's killing, and the general director of the Colombian Institute of Family Welfare, Lina Alberais, said that the acts are unjustified as their threatened children and youth. On its Twitter account, the United Nations Human Rights Committee in Colombia expressed, We condemned the killing of a 12-year-old boy that took place yesterday in Tibu, north of Santander. Our condolences to the family. We urge authorities to investigate these events. We advocate for respecting human life and protecting boys and girls.
Now we continue. Violent repression from Chile's Carabineros military police left 18 injured and at least 10 detained during the march calling out for the rights of the Mapuche people. Amid the mobilization, a human rights defender was killed. As the march headed toward the heavily transited sector of the General Bernardo O'Higgins Avenue in Santiago, police was ordered by the Minister of Interior to strike the gathering of civilians. The repressive forces used high-pressure water tanks and tear gas. The protesters of the indigenous people were called on Sunday to stage a rally in the Bustamante Park in favor of the reivindication and autonomy of the native inhabitants. This happened hours before October 12th, when 529 years of the called encounter between two worlds is commemorated as the contact of American and European civilizations in 1492 gave way to the modern era and centuries of colonial domain, which still echo in the present struggles of indigenous people and the Latin American nations. The indigenous people, the Mapuche people, the Caspazini and Amara people, they are present in Chile too, and yet we are humiliated. We are deceived. Here are community killers wiping out entire communities. We are seeing this, just annihilating truths. Here they crush the people. Though we march pacifically, they have no right. The electoral drill carried out on Sunday in Venezuela was highly attended. Our correspondent, Andre Vieira, gave us the details from Caracas. Venezuela rehearsed for mega elections set for the upcoming November 21st. Since early hours, the voters participated in a drill that took place in one of the 446 balloting centers distributed across the 333 municipalities of the country. Young people and adults attended the activity. The drill is for us to know how to vote, how to exercise our right to vote. It is easy because you don't need to find different ways. There is just one. You go, choose your preferred candidate, and that's it. It's really fast. The 21st is going to be how it ideally should be especially for someone who doesn't know his or her way around technology, which has been made simple. This process was highly attended by all the political sectors of Venezuela. Over the 70,000 candidates, 82% of the runner-ups belong to the opposition. The people's vote is meant to be a vote of transformation, so we as Venezuelans can reclaim our right to choose, so we can have governing representatives that are closer to the people, that can fight for Venezuela so we can have a democracy, where freedom is most important. Those who trigger the so-called guarimbas, those who attack the country, some of those sectors have joined this electoral process, and that also comforts us. We have been able to do so because the Venezuelan people, all of us, have brought them this far. We have achieved it with our daily work. We have managed to put them back on the path of democracy. And today, you are here, standing face to face with the voters. The drill on Sunday was witnessed by international observers from the Carter Center and the Latin American Council of Electoral Experts. We as observers, all we can do is, I think, that we are referees or linesmen in the elections of our countries. We are only judges. The Venezuelan people are the ones who will cast their votes, and for that they have their own authorities. The National Electoral Council of Venezuela highlighted the citizens' participation carried out in the activities in the 24 states of the country. Participation in this process has exceeded our expectations. It is a good sign ahead of the upcoming elections set for November 21st. Good things are coming, if only this is a warm-up stage of the process despite massive attendance. This drill is the 65th activity of the elections schedule that prepares for the turnout in November when the people will choose 3,082 representatives that will account as 23 governors, 335 mayors, 253 lawmakers, and 2,471 council members. Jesus Romero and André Vieira for Telesur from Caracas, Venezuela. Thank you, André, for this report. Now we continue. On Monday, the Vice President of the United Socialist Party of Venezuela, Diosdado Cabello, condemned the interference statements from the U.S. and some European politicians. What we won't allow is interventionism and meddling. That seems to be the fashion in all these countries that usually act as observers. However, all these observers have a lot to learn. The United States have got a lot to learn. Spain and the European Union have got a lot to learn. We can give you democracy lessons, because a minister can be 20 years in office up north or across the Atlantic. But here, if a president is re-elected, suddenly it's dictatorship and turns out it's not valid. 
And we go now to a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. On Monday, the first results of the parliament elections in Iraq were presented. The Electoral Commission of the Arab country informed on the matter. The president of the commission, Jalil Andan, reported that the preliminary provincial consults counted 9 million voters participating in the turnout. The Sadr Alliance and independent candidates won in Najaf, while Sadr saw another victory in Karbala, sharing the lead with al Fatah representatives. These elections were marked by a 59% abstention rate. Fatih Birol, head of the International Energy Agency, urged the countries who say they will implement measures to attain their climate goals before they attend the COP26 at the end of October in Glasgow. The pledges are good, rhetoric is good, but I would like to see not a big gap between the rhetoric and what is happening in the real life. It is a Herculean task, a very narrow pathway, but still possible. But here comes the important thing. We make our efforts. We try to reach his target, but even if we are not able to reach 1.5 degrees, if it is 1.6 or 1.7, it is still okay, better than having this almost 3 degrees temperature increase. If it is 1.6 or 1.7. Thousands of Greek teachers staged a 24-hour strike to protest against the new mandatory teacher evaluations and to demand more funding for public schools. Police sources said around 6,500 people turned out for the Athens March, including many high school teachers and pupils. Demonstrators accused the conservative government of violating teachers' and pupils' rights. Demonstrations also took place in other major Greek cities, such as Thessaloniki, while teachers' unions Olme said it will continue the fight to protect the futures of the pupils, public schools and other jobs, calling for more education funding. The strikers object to the conservative government's fast tracking of two new laws requiring the Education Ministry to subject teachers at both primary and high schools to regular evaluations. They also claim that the government used coronavirus pandemic restrictions to force through the laws without public debate. And a recent research by the Center for Democracy and Technology of the U.S., the CDT, revealed that electronic devices handed to students during the school closure amid the pandemic were used to spy on their kids under the pretext of protecting them. During the pandemic, U.S. schools provided tablets, laptops or Chromebooks to students at twice the rate prior to the pandemic, as well as the U.K. Despite the generosity of such act, over 80 percent of surveyed teachers and 77 percent of surveyed high school students told the CDT that their schools use surveillance software on those devices as they inspected private chats, emails and documents. The devices include AI and software that detects language and online behavior indicating the possibility of violent tendencies, suicidal ideas, drug and pornography use, and reports it to the teachers. The economically disadvantaged students are more reliant of those electronics, so the surveillance and the adult intervention turn out, turns out to be biased by race and social background. Also, the intermission in teens' privacy extends to out-of-school hours, monitoring their movements 24-7. They need more safe environments, not spying AIs. Now we address other topics. Thailand plans to fully reopen to vaccinated tourists traveling from air from countries deemed low risk from November 1st, the Premier Prayut Chan Ocha announced. He also cited the urgent need to save the country's ailing economy. Starting from November 1st, international visitors could enter Thailand without any requirement for quarantine if they are fully vaccinated and arrive by air from countries that we deem to be low risk. 
We have concluded a list of at least 10 countries where their nationals don't have to undergo quarantine. The list includes England, Singapore, Germany, China, and the United States of America. And the third phase of a clinical trial developed by Iran's Pasteur Institute with Cuba's anti-COVID-19 vaccines Sobrano 2 and Sobrano Plus showed excellent results against the Delta strain, informed on Monday the Finlay Institute of Vaccines in Havana. In charge of the immunogens, the Cuban entity detailed that the double-blind, randomized and placebo-controlled study included 24,000 subjects to whom the Zoberana O2 vaccine was applied in a two-dose regime in two cities and a booster dose with the Zoberana Plus vaccine in two other cities. During the analysis, the Delta variant of the virus had a 71.9% prevalence in July. By August, it was already 95.4%, making it widely predominant the official statement informed. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.